Good morning, everyone. This is Joseph Trevisani from Worldwide Markets. It's also good evening. It's also possibly good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, once again, I thank all of you for attending. Um, I take it as a great compliment that people take time out of their day to listen to what I have to say. And I hope this is a useful endeavor for all of us. Um, as you know, I prefer, of course, if anyone is interested, to please put your comments, considerations, and always the forlorn plea for jokes into the chat, and I'll be glad to uh, pause and talk about it. I much prefer to have these things conducted as a colloquium rather than as a lecture. We have in front of us um, the, oh, excuse me. Can everyone still see the chart? Something strange just happened to my computer. Um, okay, there we go. It disappeared. I don't know what it was. Anyway, we have a fascinating difference or a fascinating um, occasion to look at the difference between what we know and what we don't know, between how markets deal with speculation and the unknown and then waiting for facts. We have nothing to go on in this case because an exit of a major industrial power from the European Union has never happened before. So we do not know what the effects will be. It's that simple. Everything that is said in supposed knowledge of what is about to happen is conjecture. Nobody has an idea. And I would even go further. I'd say, by and large, nobody has a clue. The only information we have so far is that Britain voted to leave. We don't even know what that means, specifically. Because it's up to the government of Theresa May to decide. And in, of course, negotiation in conjunction with the European governments and the European Union bureaucracy based in Brussels, the European Commission. So we definitely do not know how this will play out. The British electorate has told us that they do not believe the dire warnings of the Remainers, or as I call them, the Remainders, um, for, how this will, for, for how this will affect the British economy. Um, I'll, I'll let you know up front, since this is part of the discussion, that I thought two things. One, that they should leave. Um, and this, I hope this doesn't color my discussion, but I want you to know where my, where my, where my opinions are. I don't know. I, I prefer coffee myself, but I was staying at a friend's house over the weekend, and I was... <laughs> <laughs> Has everybody seen that joke? And we owe Pan for that. I thank you. Um, why do the British like tea? because tea leaves. I love it. I gotta get my girls to tell this one. They'll be eight, they'll, they'll love it. Um, thank, you for, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> it's the first good joke I've seen about uh, Brexit so far. I, I, there must be some sort of joke relating Brexit to some type of cheese. Um, you know, de Gaulle's favorite comment that how can you rule a country that has 700 different kinds of cheese? Um, I haven't heard one yet, we'll see. So my opinion on this was one that they should leave because to my opinion, uh, to my personal uh, political view, sovereignty is, a national sovereignty is the best that can be hoped for when it comes to a democratic policy, democratic polity. And two, I thought that and still do think that the effects of the British departure will be minimal. And the reason is very simple. Once the emotions are over 
it is in both the British and the continental, taking it as a whole, interests to maintain the closest and tightest economic ties. And so I think that will happen. I do not, for, I do not foresee any great dislocation of economic arrangements between the continent and Europe. Very simply, the, Europe sells a ton of stuff to Britain. Britain sells a ton of stuff to Europe. Why disturb these relationships? I don't think they will. Um, and I think the greatest threat, actually, of the British departure politically um, is to the continent and the EU itself. The EU's um, experiment with the United Currency, to put it generously, is flawed. It certainly has not benefited every member of the EMU, the European Monetary Union. And those countries that have not benefited, that have been damaged by it, all retain political sovereignty. And if there's a greater cause, a greater reason for retaining and continuing to retain political sovereignty than what they have seen transpire over the past uh, almost 10 years since the financial crisis, we're looking at it. And in addition, you have the Brits now making it clear that sovereign nations can leave. Now, Britain is a special case within the European community. And I don't just mean that in the European community as a sense of the European Union right now, but I mean in, in European history. It is both isolated and protected by its geographic position and by its history and by its very close associations outside and beyond and very strong ones of culture and tradition and politics apart from Europe. Britain has the Anglosphere, as it is called sometimes, although that term's a bit out of, out of style, which it has great both political, cultural, and trade associations with. So its position outside of the, Euro, uh, of the European Union is one of both history, culture, and language. So if anyone was going to leave the EU, it would have been Britain, and thus, so it is. So if we look at what's actually happened so far, we have very little to go on. Not only do we have very little to go on because this has never happened before and the details are, as they say, TBD, to be determined, but because we also have very little information, which is why this chart is up here. Um, this is one of the few pieces of information we have as to what has actually transpired so far. And it is largely a sentiment indicator. This is the, the market economics <clears throat> a PMI report. That's Purchasing Managers Index. It is one of the uh, more closely followed, uh, one of the few actual forward-looking indicators. After how this works is they call up or poll, they probably do it by email these days, they probably don't do it by phone. Purchasing managers, uh, the, you know, mid-level and higher executives in various businesses, um, statistically determined, as they say, and ask them, how's it going? What's happening? What's going to happen? What do your orders look like? What are your plans? What are your spending plans? What are your hiring plans? Looking ahead. After all, if you want to ramp up your production, in three months, because you think whatever it is you're making, anyone who's been to business school, we know we all make widgets. If you want to do that, then you have to plan ahead. You have to order goods, you have to order raw materials, you have to set aside factory time, you have to hire perhaps. So you're planning ahead. So it has real validity as for what it's telling you. It's telling you what businesses are planning. And, not surprisingly, look at the chart. Very substantial drop-off. Now, two things are involved here. One, the trend, and all of these are the same, are has been down since basically 2014. 
every chart, every line here, manufacturing, the composite, services, and construction. All down. Now, there's a tremendous drop-off here, but they're all down. Let's take a look at another chart. I'll show you something else. Um, where is it? GDP. Where's my GDP chart? Here it is. Oops, wrong one. Sorry. This one. Oops, wrong one. It's not GDP I want. Sorry. Sorry, what is it I'm looking for here? Oh, I know what it is. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. I just remembered what I'm looking for. Okay, now, sorry about that. Okay. This is sterling. I'm a slight digression here. This is sterling going back to its high point um, above 1.7 back in mid-2014. What does this chart show? That enormous fall on the 24th, that glorious trading day. Well, I hope everybody made money on it. Um, volatility the like, which has rarely been seen, and I've been in the market for 25 years. Um, fun and games. The stuff that must have driven interbank traders bananas if they weren't enjoying it. And I'm hoping they were all short. Because in that day, the, certainly, the risk was certainly on the downside. Assumptions were it would pass. So the market was positioned for a pass. That means it probably wasn't going to go much higher. Even if it did pass, it probably would have come off, although a lot less than this. When you got the fail, you got this monumental collapse. But what is interesting about this chart? That huge fall barely broke the trend channel. The sterling has been falling for almost two years. And even this amazing collapse barely penetrated, and it didn't actually penetrate it on the day, the bottom of the trend channel. What does this tell you? That what has happened is within the market's realm of conjecture. It's not even outside the trend channel. I can't emphasize this enough because what looks like a break in the market's assessment of sterling is nothing of the kind, at least not technically. And the market returned to respect the channel. I find that fascinating. Okay. Back to the economics of the situation here. Okay, so let's go. We're looking at market. Okay, this is the market assessment. They're fascinating. They're great because they do they do an assessment of China. And it's very difficult to get any decent data out of China. Okay, excuse me. I have my my iced coffee here. It's quite hot here in New York. We're having a bit of a heat wave. We may actually get to 100 today. That's, uh, I guess, about 34 for you people who use uh, the rest of the world. I needed, to, I forgot to check. My girls asked me this. Do uh, Does Britain use Fahrenheit or centigrade? I actually don't know. I think they use Fahrenheit. Um, anyway, uh, if anyone knows, type it into the chat. I'd be interested in knowing whether they do or they don't. I can, of course, look it up, but I don't want to do it in the middle of the world. Okay, so what do we have here? Absent actual information. We have, of course, a sentiment chart. And what is likely to happen, matter of fact, you could guarantee this, um, from the passage of an, of an event or the happening of a an event like uh, the British uh, referendum on European Union membership. Well, obviously, it is the de definition of uncertainty. All we have is the vote. We don't know when. We don't know how. We don't know who's in charge. And we don't know what the result will be. So we know, basically, nada, nothing. So for all of those reasons, of course, businesses are going to pull back. I don't know what's going to happen. This is not the time to hire new people. Oh, they do use centigrade. 
As an American, I say that's disappointing, but I leave it alone. <laughs> I leave it alone. <laughs> anyway, there was a movement when I was a kid, um, you know, the middle of the last century, uh, to switch the United States over to the uh, metric system. And um, we never really went anywhere. And at this point, I would say it's certainly not going to happen. Anyway, okay. So what we have here is, that is really a sentiment chart. And, and, and it's a perfectly logical explanation. And perfectly lo logical ex expectation. Businesses have no clues what's going to happen here. Neither does anybody else. But businesses have to plan ahead. So when they are anticipating what they're going to do, they naturally enough pull back. Are we going to plan uh, to hire new people? Oh, not right now. We uh, got to see what's going to happen first. Uh, what are your new orders looking like? Well, you know, they're okay. So there isn't a lot of knowledge. There isn't a lot of information coming into businesses right now about what to do. Their expectation has to be caution. And so that's really all we're seeing in this chart. This change in the... Uh, market indexes, mark, market as in the economics com company, doesn't really tell us a great deal except that we are looking at a period of uncertainty. So when you hear from, if you do, from various commentators that this is the beginning of the Brexit collapse, do not believe it. That's interesting. So thank you for that. So they switched to the metric system on temperature, but they still use miles instead of kilometers. That's interesting. I wonder what the, I wonder what the history of that is. Anyway, um, don't want to get too far afield on this. I will definitely look this up, but thank you for that information. It's much appreciated. Um, so if you hear people, if, if people start quoting, if you hear commentators quoting this, um, these sentiment numbers, as uh, the forerunners of proof that the British economy is going to take a, a big hit from Brexit. Don't believe it. It may be true, but it may not be. And these numbers do not prove it. These numbers simply tell you that British business planners are being cautious, which is exactly what one would expect from this situation. Let's look at another number, which used to be indicative of forward-thinking businesses, but now we're not quite so sure what it is. Okay, this is the FTSE 100. Now, there was a time in the dim distant past before the financial crash, before quantitative easing, before Ben Bernanke enacted his fear of the, and I'm being unfair to Ben Bernanke, his fear of the depression in economic into ec American economic and thereby word economic policy, that the purpose of the stock market was to discount future economic growth, future uh, earnings by corporates, and factor them in to the price of the equity. That is no longer quite the case, as we know. They are now doing something else. In addition, supposedly, to their time-honored role of discounting the future into stock prices, and that is they're discounting the likelihood of further economic stimulus, i.e. asset price support from the world's central banks. I mean, I call it that, but that is its largest result. So when you, again, you look at this chart, it looks like the equity traders in the city of London and elsewhere around the world love Brexit. The logical disconnect there is so wide that you cannot take that as the only answer here. Now, it could be that the equity traders are very different in their analysis than the business purchasing managers because we have two different outlooks here. The purchasing managers 
are being, I think, understandably cautious. They don't actually know what's going to happen. That seems the most, in fact, that of course seems the most logical and sensible approach to the, this event. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. If you know what's going to happen, let us all know. But I don't think they do. But here, it looks as if the equity traders either think this is going to be a great benefit for the British economy, and you can make that argument, although I would not expect it to be made with such immediacy. I think it will end up benefiting the British economy, and I think in a very, in a very pronounced manner, but I think it's going to play out easily over a number of years, if not half decades and decades. It will simply give the British economy and British businesses much more flexibility, which they will use to generate products and profits. That's my, that's my opinion on it. I don't have proof of that, of course, it's the future. That's what looks like what's happening here. So what is going on here? So it, it seems impossible for the equity traders to have come to the conclusion so rapidly. I mean, they don't have any proof. You would think they'd wait for a little bit of proof that this is going to be good for the British economy. So what else is going on here? And I think we all know the answer. What's going on is that the judgment they're making is not that this is going to be good for the British economy, but that it is going to force the central bank, the Bank of England, into greater stimulus of some sort or other. Either lower interest rates, either more uh, purchases. They have not changed. I think they're Still doing 375, if I remember. Um, so that's really what this judgment is. This is not a, that's correct, of course. There is nowhere else to put investment. I mean, I was listening to, uh, as I often tell you on, on these webinars, I was listening to uh, Tom Keen and Michael McKee on the way in, um, talking uh, with their program surveillance on Bloomberg Radio in New York. Uh, for people in the United States, I will give them an unsolicited plug. It is the best economics show that I know of. It is You can learn more listening to these two guys um, than anywhere else in media that I know of. I cannot speak highly enough of their efforts and their show and, and, their, and their willingness to be real journalists, that is to keep um, opinions out of it and teach. Fascinating show. Anyway. Um, so that's exactly right, as in the comment. The background to the equity markets in the world has not changed a whit. In fact, it's more of the same. It's expected that although they have delayed, the Japanese will start more. I mean, if ever there was a sign of something that doesn't work to do more. It's the Japanese bout with stimulus going back 20 years now. And the Bank of England and other banks are expected to follow also. So that is really what we're looking at here. You look at the American equity markets, you have the same uh, sharp rise. You have the US uh, S&P, I believe on Friday, setting a new record. Uh, so far, the United States growth, this year is going to be three it's going to be below two percent the first two quarters most likely that hardly warrants a record level of the equities but we all know where we are with this so there's no surprise here. so that is what we're looking at as far as the equity markets go so we have two very different reactions and this has to do very much with the bizarre economic world we're living in. Equities and bonds are doing very little to tell you anything about the future, except as it relates to central bank policy. 
Because if that's not true, then you have an enormous disconnect, as we all know, between the bond markets and equities. Equities are telling you everything's hunky-dory. If we take them in their traditional role as discounters of the future into the present pricing, equities are telling you, at least in the United States, and Britain, and other places, things are hunky-dory. We're looking at a great future. The best of all times and the best of all possible worlds, as Pangloss might have put it, that's Voltaire. But uh, bonds are telling you we are headed for danger because rates are low. Whenever rates are low and bond prices are high, they are typically part of the counter cyclical central bank policy. But of course, we all know that's not the case. The reason rates are low is because central banks have spent the better part of a decade forcing them down. Central banks are getting close to running out of, at least in the continent and in Japan, running out of enough bonds to buy because there aren't any more bonds. So where does that lead very perversely? Well, it leads to a greater license for central governments to issue more debt. So the cycle is a problem. That's not our topic today. So we're having, we have this disconnect. We have the business barometers telling you at the very least, we need to be cautious. We have the equities telling you, gangbusters, baby, getting better. So you have to somewhere come to the conclusion that the equities are no longer useful in telling us about the future at least about the economic future. If there were some indicator that we could look at, just take a, you know, take a thought experiment here, that would tell us that British, Britain, the British economy is going to hit a recession, guaranteed because of Brexit. Looking at this chart, what would that, where, where, where would, look at what this chart is telling us from what we already know, which is not that, of course. What would be the likely reaction of equities? It's probably similar to what we're looking at already because the assumption would be that more price support is coming out of the world central banks. So we know from what we're looking at that the equities are not telling us anything useful about the effects of Brexit. They're making a considered judgment that markets, but central banks in particular, don't like uncertainty. They distrust it. They distrust markets as well. And that the greatest possibility for action after this vote is that the central banks will sooner or later provide liquidity. Behind that assumption, of course, is the assumption that there will be economic costs, at least immediate and probably medium term to Brexit. So in a perverse way, this chart, despite its rising price level, is a warning. It's actually the same warning as being given by the market PMI reading. Even though it doesn't look like it, it actually is. Because what it's doing there is telling you central banks are concerned, their policy response will be, as it has always been the past nine years, more liquidity, 
more lower interest rates, the same thing they've done for 10 years. Um, and therefore that, that's what prompts prices are. Okay, so, so we have a similar, not surprisingly of course, um, logic from both. So let's actually look at some real numbers which you actually have for June. Okay, in Britain, this is, it went to June, yes. Industrial output. Okay, this actually is June. That's June right there. So we have a real figure here. Um, let me see, we have some comments here. Just take a look. Um, I think you're right. I think Mark. I think they probably will cut rates again. Um, I think they would probably like bond demand to fall. I don't think that that's what they expect, though. I mean, if lower rate, if the rates go down, then you have then the bond prices are going to go higher, and so um, that may or may not cut demand, but it will certainly drive prices up. Okay, and it is possible. Um, that higher prices at some point will diminish the demand for bonds. But we have to admit that looking back over the past couple of years, we haven't seen that. Um, the higher prices go, the greater the demand. That's also not the way it's supposed to be. But let's keep going. So if we look at industrial production in June, we do see a fall. Um, now, this is not far, be I didn't put the, chart, the graph points in here, but this is not beyond the slight downward slope we've been seeing since 2013. And it's not even the sharpest decline that we've seen. This is really very little different than this. And it's certainly not as pronounced as this right here. It's not different than this. It's rarely different than this or this. So this amount of industrial production, now again, think about what it is that we're, this is construction. Think about what it is that we're talking about. There is, with industrial production, with construction, there is certainly an element, as there is with the PMI reports, that we are anticipatory. That's why people look at this. If you have a construction job, what are you building? Well, you could be renovating, but if you are building something, then why are you building it? You are building it in anticipation of someone buying it, of someone renting it, of it somehow generating income at some point in the future, presumably when your construction is finished. So you are working now as a construction worker, as a supplier for future consideration, for f anticipated economic return at some point. So in that sense, the that portion of industrial production that is provided there is anticipatory. Now it's not all of it, of course, and it, it, it's not even the majority, but it is one of the more adjustable factors, shall we say? Because if you're running a plant and you're fulfilling orders that already exist. You're going to continue until those orders are completed. That was anticipatory six months ago or a year ago. But construction is being placed for a greater degree, you would say, of anticipatory earnings. So in a way, it's more of a forerunner, of more of a predictor than, say, current orders. Um, And seeing a fall in construction is very similar to what we saw 
in the market survey of purchasing managers and uh, purchasing managers orders. Same type of uncertainty, I think, is depicted. I mean, as I said, look at the construction output here. This isn't even the sharpest or the or the biggest decline in the past two and a half or three years. Caveat to all of these items is that these numbers, the market numbers as well, are for June. The great majority of June, everyone was sitting in anticipation of a failure of this referendum. So there may have been a good portion of delay, meaning people are saying, you know, I'm just not going to place my orders this month. I'm not going to plan do some forward planning. Um, I'm just going to be very, very cautious until I have some concrete idea of what, until I know what's going to happen with this vote. So there's going to be a certain degree of inhibitory. Um, my guess is that's relatively minor, simply because everybody in creation thought that this would fail, including myself. I did not think this referendum would pass. I thought that when people came down to vote, they would choose the unsatisfactory present as opposed to the uncertain future. That's what I expected. I was wrong um, as far as the outcome of the vote goes. So I think the anticipatory uh, or the hesitation for business planners going into the vote was probably a, sm a smaller factor in this than was free. Now, I don't know when the uh, market polls were conducted. My guess is they were largely conducted before the vote, the market, the market uh, statistics for PMI that we looked at earlier. Um, this is an actual output number. So, you know, we're in July, it's the third week of July already. Um, by the way, um, I'll let everyone know, I'll be going on vacation probably for most of August. So we will be have these uh, webinars will pause uh, until I come back in September. Uh, our Labor Day holiday here in the United States is late. It's September 5th, and I will not be back before that. But we'll, we'll put the schedule up there. Um, so this number is actually a an economic statistic out of the British economy. And so this incorporates real effect, not simply anticipatory. I thought we'd take a look at the inflation number, not that it's particularly attached to the Brexit vote. So here I have the inflation number. We've had a slight tick up. This is um, this is the harmonized you know, one that the, uh, the EU uses. And so you've had a slight uptick in inflation. It doesn't mean very much. I just thought we put it up there. Okay, and let's look at uh, industrial production. Okay. Okay, so this industrial production, again, for June, of the wider number, it has incorporated the end of the last week when the Brexit uh, result was known. It's not a particularly, in my mind, a meaningful number as yet for two reasons. One, it's not really out of line of anything we've seen monthly movement over the past one, two and a half years. It only incorporates one week of change, and we really don't have any sense of any predictive quality to this number. So we have to wait. The real statistics that are going to tell us something about the British economies and British business planners' response to Brexit is only going to be when we start getting July numbers. June is not going to tell us very much. Um, but it's all we have so far. And we're not going to be getting the July numbers 
for another two weeks, starting another two weeks. I don't actually have the schedule of things, but that's where we are. Okay, so let's look at a number, another predictive number that has some value, but not a lot. But it's the best we've got. Again, it's a little early to be looking at this. Okay. But because it's having such a profound effect in the markets, uh, equities sterling, and of course the British uh, credit markets, I thought it was important to, to look at this now where the responses that we've seen in the markets and in actual figures are almost purely anticipatory. We don't know if British industry is going to start pulling back on its orders, whether it's going to start pulling back on its hiring, whether wages or wage increases are going to go down. We don't know if orders are going to stop coming to British firms from overseas. My guess is no. Why would they? But we don't know that. So almost every number we have is really anticipatory. And so far, there has been nothing to show us anything more than caution. And that's in, in, the, in the Brexit, in the, uh, the market numbers. So here we have the National Institute of, it's a British economic and uh, social, I forget the last part of it. Anyway, it's the estimate for the second quarter GDP. Well, check that out. It's flat. They have no clue as to what's going to happen either. So even when you look at the numbers out of professional prognosticators, those who hold the crystal balls in their hands and gaze into the future for all of us, and we give them credit for knowing what is going to happen, which in fact, they have no greater clue than anybody else. Um, if you look at our own central bank here in the United States predictions on everything, from pretty much, uh, they've been wrong. Their predictions on GDP are uniformly too optimistic. Their predictions on unemployment were too pessimistic. Their predictions on inflation seem so matter of fact that they hardly seem to have any predictive ability at all. So the idea that um, central banks or anyone is any more reliable as predicting the future, it's on pretty flimsy ground. The stock market, when it was composed of actual price discounters as far as what to buy, had a better chance of predicting the future um, than the Fed. However, it also is a psychological creature in the old line, as you know. The stock market has predicted, you know, 10 of the last four recessions, something like that. So none of these particular ways of looking at the future will do us a great deal. But nevertheless, we have to work with what we've got. So the gnomes, the statisticians in the British government, clearly don't have a clue either as to what is going to happen. There are no standards to judge by. Okay. Let's take a look at some other numbers, which are actual numbers. These are house prices. So what is the virtue of a number like retail sales or house prices? What would they, they well, basically, there's simply a lot, many more people involved in producing the statistics. What do I mean? Well, at the British National Institute of whatever, that is producing the number we just the 0 0.6 uh, estimate that we just looked at, you have, let's be optimistic, 100 statisticians and economists participating in the process of producing this number. That's 100. Of course, they do more math, and they run more equations, and they do a lot more computer simulation. 
but still, there are not a lot of them making the decision um, going into this number. So what do we see from a retail number? Well, we see millions and millions and millions and millions of people making retail decisions. So the base, statistical base for the number is probably much more reliable. Now, there are many other factors involved. So let's assume that what I said is accurate, that it gives us a better gauge than the economists typing away and running their models in some basement someplace of some bureaucracy. So here, this is a June number. We've also seen a fall in retail sales. Does this tell us that everyone is terrified of Brexit and they're all going to everybody stop spending and they're putting their money under their flower pots? Obviously not. Look at the volatility in this year on year particular number over the past two and a half years. There's absolutely nothing out of the ordinary that we're seeing for June. Now, again, the same caveat applies. June is one quarter at best related to the Brexit vote in actual numbers because the vote didn't happen until the 23rd and everybody assumed that it was going to fail. Well, not everybody, but. Okay, so let's look at a number, another one. This is house prices in Britain. The decline, this is also for June. The decline in housing prices predates any event in June. So again, we are looking at continuation of pre-existing trends, perhaps exacerbated. It's certainly possible logically that anyone who was deciding to buy a house decided to pause in the last week of June based on the result of the Brexit vote. That's certainly true. But as with all of the other numbers we looked at, and particularly the Sterling chart, there isn't any indication that we have a new trend here. Okay, let's, let's take a look at one or two other statistics and then we'll wrap up here. This is a similar this is a, uh, what is this, CBI, Council of British Industry, I believe, or Consortium of British, I think Council of British Industry. It's quarterly optimism. This is basically the PMI statistics writ large. Now that's a substantial drop. That's a drop akin to the collapse during the financial crisis. So if anything is looking to create worry, I think this probably has more validity than any of the other numbers out there. Because this is, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the market numbers, um, the PMI numbers, they take a, a it's a pretty wide range of statistics, I mean, uh, of inputs. They'll look at new orders, they'll look at hiring plans, things like that. Things relatively close to decision making. This is a broader view. And British industry, <coughs> excuse me, from, you know, the proverbial 30,000 foot view, has been considering the potential effects of the British exit. 
if you were you know a purchasing manager you may not have been worried about it until the day of the election day of the referendum but if you're a company executive and you're thinking about what may happen then you have to start long before the actual vote and take into consideration what could possibly happen run the scenario although I think we have the same result meaning that the only thing you can actually predict is that you need to be cautious is that you need to postpone perhaps your spending plans your hiring plans your ordering plans for raw materials and stuff like that until you have a better sense of what this will actually mean It certainly looked a bit chaotic the day or two after the vote. Does everybody remember the uh, that petition? My friends of mine wanted me to sign this. I thought it was preposterous. Um, the petition that went around demanding, demanding a new vote, a new referendum, one that would require, what was it, 60% was it a 60% pass rate and a 70 cent participation rate or 70% pass rate and a 60% participation rate? I, I forget. If there ever was a, I mean, the childishness of that is beyond belief. I didn't get what I wanted. I'm taking my ball and going home. It was silly. Of course, it never went anywhere. Um, but it was a sentiment relatively widely felt at the time. So the only possible really judgment get to be made is one that we're seeing, is that the amount of caution has risen dramatically. We're short of statistics, and my guess is that the, st the actual statistics are not going to show very much of a change, because after all, Nothing has happened. Yes, of course, the vote was had, but nothing else has changed. If you are ordering Land Rovers from Munich, my guess is you're still ordering Land Rovers, meaning from Munich to Britain. If you are ordering Stout from someplace, you're still going to. So the actual results, I think, of changes in an industry, industry orders and industry production, are going to be far less until we have some sense, and this is not going to happen for many months, of how this is going to take place and the actual changes. There may be that the Continentals get angry and put huge barriers up as far as tariffs go, and the British retire every day the same thing. I do not expect that at all, but it does remain a possibility. So I think we'll see, again, that as the numbers start to come in from July, we're going to see very little change except in the anticipatory component of these numbers. In other words, orders from the continent are not going to fall off. They're not going to drop off a cliff. Because there's no reason to whatsoever. But you will see in the planning section of things more hesitation. So I expect that a lot of the actual numbers as they come out will show relatively small declines, but declines nonetheless in a lot of the optimism. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit more about the sterling, since after all, we're all currency traders here, among other things. And what this actually means, and then we'll wrap up, because we're, we're close to the end here. And this decline, Uh, over two and a half years, 14, 15, and we're halfway through nine now. It's certainly not a comment on the British Brexit vote. 
It's not a comment on the British election. Cameron's last election. What is it a comment on? It's a good question. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> um, I think its greatest import, its greatest meaning, has to do with the realization around the world. And you've heard this theme from me before, that the extraordinary policies of central banks everywhere around the world are incapable of producing, of succeeding at their goal to produce a sustaining, self-supporting, economic recovery. Yes, we have growth. How could you not have growth, I would, I would say, with interest rates at these levels? But the ability of the central banks to manage, frankly, I've always thought that that's a bit of a, more than a bit of hubris, to manage the global economy whose purpose, after all, is to coordinate the economic activities of a few billion people. That's the purpose of the economy. That's what it does. Um, has been vastly overstated. And, and one of the things that happens, and has happened uniformly throughout this, not just since the financial crisis, but also since, since the Second World War, but certainly in the era of free currency trading, free floating currencies, is that the US dollar um, and lately the Japanese one, yen are the beneficiaries whenever there is heightened concern. And I think that is the primary import of this particular chart. Because this long predates the British vote. But the pound has fallen substantially and over time, which is the type of trend that is most fundamental, most fundamentally based, um, certainly far more than equity trends right now. Because as we know, equity trends are both fostered and indeed demanded by central bank policy. Okay, folks, um, I thank you all for attending. That's really it. Um, I hope this has been useful. Um, I thank you all for attending. I will type in my email and Adinda will put it up. If anyone has any questions, I will be happy to uh, address them. I also sent, uh, asked last, uh, at the last session, um, I asked for some comments and uh, some suggestions for future webinars. I did get a few. I thank you for them, and I will be responding to them, and we will put one up. Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, everyone have a good day, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Take care.